David, so good to, to speak with you. The UN says that famine in Gaza is now imminent. Just tell us all of your concerns, especially trying to get aid in. I think the first point to understand is that, that when you say the UN says famine is imminent, this isn't some official in New York dreaming up a press release. The International Phase Classification System is an incredibly technocratic, technical, even conservative process for assessing five levels of food insecurity. And what's happened in Gaza over the last five months is that half the population are now at level five, which is called catastrophic. And those lucky enough not to be at level five are either at level four or level three, which is emergency or crisis. So essentially the whole population doesn't know where its next meal is coming from. And this is an unprecedented situation, to have the whole population in that situation. But it's also unprecedented the speed with which this crisis has become, has gripped the Gaza Strip. We, uh, my own organization, we have doctors at one of the hospitals, orthopedic surgeons, with our partners Medical Aid for Palestinians, who are a UK-based group. We have local partners elsewhere in the Gaza Strip trying to do health work, child protection work. And the grip of the famine threat is palpable whenever you have a conversation with anyone who is working there or is engaged there. It's horrifying, very experienced aid workers. And it's obviously not independent of the conflict, but there's absolutely no, there can't be a suggestion that food going in is somehow a security threat. But what we know is that bureaucratic impediments, limits on the number of trucks going in, double inspections of uh, trucks, blockages on aid convoys. There, is argue there are arguments about dual use. You know, a, a pair of medical scissors suddenly is not allowed in because it's considered to could be used for military uh, purposes. But above all, the food restrictions are leaving the population in, an, in a, a situation that's beyond desperate. What would you say to Israeli officials then? I would say release the stranglehold on the number of trucks going in. S streamline the process for vetting, because once the UN have vetted it, that it's food, you've got to be able to smooth the flow. The blockages that exist within the Gaza Strip, because it's not just getting over the border at Rafa or at Kerem Shalom, uh, it's also a matter of opening other crossing points, because we need to make sure that the whole of the Gaza Strip receives food aid. Remember, in the north of Gaza, you've got a population that uh, was considered beyond the conflict uh, after the first couple of months. There's now a new uh, resurgence in the Al-Shifa hospital of, of uh, fighting. But there can't be a military justification for the restriction on uh, food aid or the other restrictions that are preventing humanitarian aid from flowing. When I've spoken to Israeli officials, they've pointed the finger of blame at Hamas. They've said that criminal elements are, are hoarding the aid coming in. They've also pointed the finger of blame at aid agencies and said they've been part of the problem as well. They've said the UN is not, doing, is not working efficiently enough to get the aid in. How do you respond to that? Well, I'm giving very precise, very practical examples of what the Israeli authorities can do. I also say very clearly that the consequences for the population of the fighting in the Gaza Strip is the responsibility of all parties to the conflict. Of course, that's right. When it comes to the question of aid flows, the Israeli authorities are in absolute charge. They're in a veto position for the flow of aid in and across the Gaza Strip. And so I know from our own work how seriously we take efforts to prevent the diversion of aid. I speak to the doctors who are trying to perform operations without the scissors, without the saline, without, a, without the ability even to give water to a dying man. I mean, these are excruciating stories of people who are committing their lives to humanitarian work. They're not allied with any political faction or party uh, to the conflict. And so we are in a desperate struggle to help keep people alive. And we need the international attention, but also the local attention to make that possible. Just in respect of the UN, there are serious allegations that have been made against uh, 12 people in UNRWA. There's an investigation being led by Mrs. Colonna, the former foreign minister of uh, France, very distinguished official. I think she's even reporting today or, or tomorrow with her interim report to the Security Council. Of course, that should be taken seriously.
the civilians of Gaza, 2.2 million Palestinians and 100 hostages, let's not forget them, they shouldn't be paying the price. And ultimately, Israel is the occupying force on the ground. Shouldn't they be managing the, the aid coming in, the distribution to ensure that there isn't a stampede and we don't see over 100 people dead in some instances? Well, certainly, yes. I mean, it's incumbent on them to fulfill their responsibilities. One of the arguments that we've been making around this question of airdrops, because you can understand people saying, well, look, if, 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 if you're desperate to get food, surely anything should be on the table. Of course, that's right. But what we also know from our experience around the world, we're an international humanitarian aid organization, we know that airdrops are risky, they're expensive, and that's not a distribution channel to drop something on a beach, because what happens when you've dropped it? What kind of scrum exists? What kind of distribution mechanism exists? So we think there are some very straightforward ways that could at least ease the humanitarian suffering above all the threat of famine. The UN has said we need a tsunami of food to, to go in there, and I think that's absolutely right, both aid and commercial, actually. But that applies to medicines as well, which are desperately, desperately needed. Do you find it extraordinary that the United States, Israel's staunchest ally, has had to resort to what you're talking about, the, the airdrops, the fact that this is the most ineffective way to get aid into the Gaza Strip, and rather than using uh, you know, the various other uh, border crossings, they've had to resort to this, and now talking about building a, a, a pier? Yes, you're right. I mean, the first, second, third best options are to use the crossings, expand the number of crossings, ease the bureaucracy uh, for transmission within uh, Gaza. So yes, it is an extraordinary commentary on the humanitarian situation that these fourth and fifth best options are having to be addressed, but that's the situation we're in. It speaks to my first answer to you. These are technical experts, not politicians, saying, sounding the alarm at the highest possible decibel level because two million lives are at stake. Is it then frustrating for you when you see the way that the United States isn't able to leverage its, its uh, you know, power over or the leverages it has over Israel? Well, frustration is a very diplomatic word to use about an imminent threat of famine to 50% of 2 million, 2.2 million uh, people. It's about like saying you're concerned. You need to be more than concerned about the uh, situation, especially if you're in the position of trying to do the maximum possible for humanitarian reasons, not political reasons. We're independent, we're neutral, we're impartial. We're about civilians who are innocent of this crisis. They didn't have anything to do with what happened on October the 7th. They are victims of this situation and international law, never mind common morality, protects them or should protect them. And the protection isn't there at the moment. But in order to, to achieve what you're asking to achieve, the United States needs to be tougher on Israel, does it not? I mean, we've seen the likes of Chuck Schumer, sort of, you know, top Democrat, speaking up and saying, look, we need to resolve this issue. Israel shouldn't become a prior state. So that the politics needs to be resolved in order to deal with the humanitarian crisis. Well, every humanitarian emergency I've learned in the last 10 years, every humanitarian emergency is a political emergency. The humanitarian world is separate from the political world, but it bears the consequences of the political world. Now, what we've got in the case of the food aid, I think, is a very clear case where no one can argue that the distribution of food is a security threat to Israel. It's a lifesaver for people in Gaza. I would make the same argument for medical uh, supplies. That's the humanitarian imperative. And imperative is a very strong word, but it's a very good word to use. Obviously, the wider politics, the wider sustainable ceasefire, we're calling for an immediate ceasefire because that's the only way to guarantee life and limb. It's the only way to make sure that everyone across Gaza gets, it, gets their, um, gets their uh, aid. It's the only way, as uh, General Eisenkot said in the Israeli cabinet, that's the way to get the hostages out as well, to get this ceasefire. Uh, negotiated. But a sustainable ceasefire obviously involves a lot more politics. You know that very, very well. But my point is, the longer the, every humanitarian emergency goes on, the harder it is to fix the politics. Every day 
of this suffering makes the wider politics more difficult. Every untended humanitarian crisis is fuel for political instability. We're sort of seeing the polarization globally. You've been foreign secretary yourself. We've spoken about uh, the politics of, of these things and how it's intertwined with the humanitarian crisis. Do you then see a, a massive lack of uh, sort of political will? Is, is, there a, is there sort of a leadership vacuum that we're seeing in this country, in the United States, by the West? Because the Europeans can do a lot more too. Yes, but it's not just a leadership. You can't have a leadership vacuum just from one set of countries or one set of powers. Look, the historical perspective on this is pretty striking. We're a world that doesn't have empires anymore. We're a world that doesn't have balance of power as existed in the Cold War anymore. We're a world that has a weakened multilateral system, although in Europe you have the benefits for 27 countries of the European Union. We're not going to get into, we're not going to get into that. Um, so you don't have a governing order. That's the nature of the vacuum that you're describing. And some people call it a multipolar world. I, I think that gives too much sense of balance. I call it a multi-aligned world with a much more fluidity, much more competing centers of economic, military, political power. So the answer to your question is, yes, there is a, a leadership vacuum, but you can't clap with one hand. I mean, there's, there's many aspects uh, to this because there's no world where the Western countries click their fingers and then things work as they want. You've got major powers in the Middle East in the form of the Gulf states. You've got significant power in the form of Qatar. You've still got Russian, significant Russian presence re-emerged in the Middle East, as you know well, in uh, Syria uh, since 2013. So this is, a, uh, this is a complicated world. It's a multi-aligned world. Uh, but it's a world that hasn't found its bearings for, for, for order, and that's why you're seeing so much disorder. Because remember, this is almost the worst thing, Gaza came out number two on the IRC's emergency watch list this year. We publish every year a statistically based, um, if you like, league table of humanitarian catastrophe. Sudan was number one, and we haven't even talked about that in the, so far in this interview. I mean, 25 million people in Sudan in humanitarian need, millions of refugees into incredibly poor countries like Chad and South Sudan, where I recently was, Egypt and the United Arab Emirates on different sides of the Sudanese civil war, that's the leadership vacuum too. It is, and I want to get to Sudan because we have sent uh, teams, Sky News teams there in the last few weeks, we've been covering it, we've been covering the situation in the DRC as well, but I just want to pick up on this kind of where the world is right now. Do you think then there is this false expectation then and a reliance on American power that when America used to once be able to not necessarily click its fingers but do more that perhaps we shouldn't lean so much and expect so much from the United States? Well, I think that the demand for responsibility is the right one. I wrote a piece last year in, in the magazine Foreign Affairs saying that Ukraine had united the West but divided it from the rest. And the reason was that not that the rest supported the invasion of one country by another, but that they wanted uh, the issues that dominate their lives around climate, around development, uh, to be properly addressed in a way that was managing the global commons in a sustained and sustainable way. And I think that demand for responsibility from Western countries is well-founded. I don't think that those of us who come from the democratic West should be somehow palming off those questions. We should actually tell the truth about what we're doing right and what we haven't done right. But I think that we are in a position now where the fulfillment of Western responsibility, which I think could be much better in all sorts of ways, is not on its own going to build a sustainable world order. You've got a Chinese economy that's a massive part of the global economy and intertwined with the Western economy. You've got medium-sized powers in the Gulf, in Turkey, um, Indonesia, India. These are serious players in the global uh, system. And so uh, just as it's right that, that the West takes serious its own responsibilities, it shouldn't go into a kind of guilt complex where it says everything's our fault, because I don't think that's true. I want to now talk about some of these other issues that, that you've raised. 
we sort of don't like the phrase forgotten wars. But frankly, you know, it isn't in the public discourse. It isn't being talked about. But these are issues that you deal with every day, whether that is Sudan or, or humanitarian crises in places like Yemen or Syria or Afghanistan that continues to rage on, but, but isn't necessarily making headlines globally, isn't something that people are necessarily talking about. Well, I think that we've got to be careful not to fall into a kind of golden ageism that says, well, years ago, everyone was talking about Yemen or everyone was talking about Ethiopia or, or, or whatever. Uh, in some ways, global consciousness, you know, the phone in your hand, that, that's connecting people, that there's more visibility. But there is a sense of disempowerment. There's a sense of, well, what can we do? Actually, we're in London. The British public respond with empathy and with commitment when they're asked to make a difference. And I think that there is a real challenge that this sense of political vacuum is allowing the number of crises to multiply. So people think, oh my God, I can't, how do you even begin? One reason we published that emergency watch list I uh, mentioned is, is to try and overcome that sense of, um, God, this is Mount Everest, how are we ever going to scale it? If I say to you, there's 300 million people in humanitarian need in the world, which is true, you might think, well, that's um, insoluble. If I say to you, there are 20 countries that account for 86% of those people, and those countries have got different allies, different enemies, different contexts, but actually, you can. this is what needs to happen in Gaza, this is what needs to happen in Sudan, this is the way to... Uh, work in Yemen, this is what's happening in West Africa and how civilians can be protected from some of the changes that are going on. It becomes a more manageable operation. And part of my job, I think, part of our job, is not just to be a really good humanitarian aid agency at the front line, delivering evidence-based, cost-effective interventions. It's also to say, don't give up, because actually the world has more resources than ever before, and it's a choice not to use those resources to help staunch the pain and or staunch the bleeding and address the pain. Are you optimistic, though? I mean, you look at these reports. You've been in this business for, for a long time. I was speaking to Martin Griffiths, who said, you know, in my five uh, sort of decade career, this has for me felt like the, the worst period. Is that because we're exposed to more, we're seeing more, or is, well, is there something else? Well, there's a lot that's bad. But I always say to people, if you look at the statistics, you get depressed. If you look at the people, you have hope. I was in South Sudan. The statistics paint a very grim picture. But when, you, when you're in Juba meeting community groups, you think, my God, they're really trying to take control of their future. When you go to Magan, which is on the, close to the Sudanese border, you've got refugees coming across. You've got people, you know, right in my mind's eye, there's a woman who was a... Um, she, was a, she worked as a hairdresser in Khartoum, hundreds of kilometers away. Her husband was a shoemaker. The greatest pride she had was that her kids, both of her kids, were going to university. Now, all four of them are refugees in South Sudan. But she's not giving up. She's not saying, well, you know, that's, that was then and, 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 and we're stuck here forever. She's saying... Uh, uh, by God, I'm not going to. I'm not going to betray my children's future. So, what right do we have then, when people like that are showing that sort of courage and tenacity and commitment? We've got to take the right lesson of this. I do think there is something that's different, and that is the growth of what I call impunity in conflict. Impunity is the exercise of power without responsibility, without accountability. In the worst case, it's crimes without punishment. And we are seeing in the conflict zones that we work the rise of impunity because the rules and norms and guardrails that were built after 1945, they're being eroded. And the people paying the price are the civilians. And our argument is we've got to rebuild countervailing power against the abuse of power. Because if we, go to a, if we end up in a world that where... The, the strong do what they will and the rest bear the consequences. It's not going to be a world that's good to live in. So we've got big responsibility, I think. What do we do then? How do you do that? Well, you build countervailing power through transparency, by bearing witness to what's going on. You build countervailing power by making sure that girls as well as boys have education in Afghanistan or anywhere else. You make sure that you call out 
the abuse of power wherever it exists. And you also say to Western countries, this goes back to something we were talking about earlier, get your own houses in order. Make sure that you're actually living out the values that you've signed up to. David Miliband, really good to talk to you. Thank you very much.